We did work out that we were at the first BrewCon, uh, which is pretty neat to be back here together. Um, we didn't talk together, but we were hanging out. So yeah. It's nice to be here eight years later. All right. Well, basic intros. That's me in all sorts of different formats. That's me. <laughs> Fucking golfing, man. That's awesome. That's, and he's wearing the same shirt, which just makes me happy. It's our ProdSec shirt, which fits awesomely. <laughs> So our, our, our disclaimers, because not only are Chris and I really good friends, we probably, when we talk to audiences together, we end up like talking with each other. So there's probably be times where we're going to act like we're talking to each other, and we are, um, which also means that we'll swear and we'll say stuff that we would normally say when we're hanging out together. So sorry, not sorry. Um, we're also kind of opinionated. I mean, I guess that's because we're Americans and we see the world pretty different than other people. Um, <laughs> I just I'm gonna let you sit there with that for a second. <laughs> yeah, if you don't that laugh, just you're lying to yourself. <laughs> it just gets better every yeah. time you look to a different area. Yeah, it's um, just just gives the whole time. <laughs> all right. Anyway, so my my etymology of I guess where I came from is is going from a big law firm to a big carrier provider to a vicious corporate overlord to a company nobody's ever heard of to building my own company. Um, all of those things in different roles, whether it was being a sysadmin, firewall jockey, at Sprint I was a security designer, an architect, and then I ran a bunch of security teams. Uh, at KPMG I was somebody who just got beaten and yelled at all the time. Um, <laughs> at Alt Tech, uh, I built a team of people who did services for, for value-added resellers. So it was like having a million salespeople who all said, we have pen testers and security people, and then they'd bring us in, and I'd have to like put on somebody else's shirt the next day and be like, hey, I'm from so-and-so company, and like we're here to do your pen testing. Um, and then decided that it sucked making everybody else rich, so I started my own company, which that's such a hard thing to do. Um, and I'm just now starting to learn to like it almost 10 years into it. Um, so that's, 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 that's my history. Oh, so that's me. Um, I actually started when I graduated college doing my IT stuff here at Shape, uh, like an hour from here, right? Uh, doing layer two, layer three things, making sure people could communicate from the port of Antwerp or out in the woods. Um, from there, a bunch of red teamy jobs. So I've been smashing things for a while. I smashed the most things when I was at Lars. Um, and then I kind of hit a point, and I gave a whole talk on this at RuxCon, but I hit a point where I kind of wanted to see like why nobody was getting better. And so this, the Facebook opportunity presented itself to kind of do both, where I got to smash things, but also I was on the blue team, so I got to fix things and start to see the other side of the things. And this really started to open my eyes, and then Chris and I started having a lot of conversations about all the things I was learning uh, moving from fixer or from breaker to fixer. Uh, so a lot of this talk is, comes from that. And so now I'm at Uber, and I'm on the incident response team there, so I'm mostly doing blue team things, but uh, we're moving into... We're, I'm actually implementing the things we're going to talk about today. So it's, uh, I really want feedback on if you want to call bullshit on this. Like, really want, if it's bullshit, to let me know uh, before I invest a whole lot of my life into f continuing down this path. So. All right, so stuff that, you know, Chris and I are known for is red teaming um, and, and doing mixed discipline attacking, whether it's breaking into facilities or individual code snippets. Uh, we, we worked on... The pen test execution standard, I don't know if any of you have heard or seen that stuff. Um, pretty much just because it sucked because people use the word pen testing all the time. And then if you went to go look up what is pen testing, there was just no definition. It was like, use Nessus. Then it was like, make O'Day. And it was just all over the place. So we tried to make some standardization around it. Code <laughs> audits? Code reviews? <laughs> Nothing. We've right, done some good. incident response stuff before. I'm doing a lot of that. I see that every this, week. This is Chris's daily job That's my right daily now. job, hence the shirt. Uh, <laughs> um, we do some risk analysis and kind of understanding of, of how risky certain actions or behaviors are for people. Uh, do some physical security. Uh, and we've also done a lot of social engineering. Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so that's, 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 the, that's the history of us, okay? We're good. We're good. All right. So, so uh, we got red teamed at work, and uh, I have to not say, not by us, not <laughs> not, by, not by these guys. Actually, it was one of those ones where like I, I didn't know it was coming, and so we had some weird alert finally pop off, and 
I remember saying, uh, oh, that can't be uh, bad guys because they would be doing way worse than um, what, what we saw this alert for. Um, it, it wasn't fun. It's usually me doing this, so I, I was really having a, a problem with um, how things were going with that. So that's basically how I felt when they were like, oh, yeah, we just like compromised everything you had and didn't do all that, so nothing. All right. <laughs> it hurts. It hurts. It, that's about how I felt on the call when we were doing the outbrief. And then I had like a lot of reflection of like, hmm, I'm sitting. I'm, I'm, pictures. I'm sitting on the outbrief, and the guys were like, they did a reverse SSL shell out. That's how they were doing C2. And they were like, oh, yeah, so you just need to do, uh, look for two small NetFlow packets followed by a couple big ones. And I was like, <laughs> well, you've just been tearing us up for like the last two weeks, and I didn't see any of that. So I'm not sure how I would have seen that over NetFlow as well, given, I mean, if you think about Uber, it's huge, right? So um, we have a lot of outbound traffic. So I was just like, that's, that's not going to work. So I was like, man, was I that asshole on the phone? Because I've been doing consulting for 10 years. I was like, did I? I probably was that guy. And I, 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 I really reflected for a couple days about it. I think I called Chris and was like talking to you. I was like, man, like I had to listen to these guys talk about this. And I was like, I really started thinking about recommendations and all the recommendations I, I had given. So uh, the this came from a DerbyCon talk. The rest of the recommendations in this, te in this deck are actually pretty good, but I honed in on this one. So I think these are really bad for the most part. <laughs> Who is able to actually, so let's take the first one. Who's able to actually send something or talk to every Windows computer in their fleet at work? Anyone? Nobody. Not one single person was able to. So, so like e deploying EMET is probably like the easiest one to implement of that whole list. Um, how about, like, can you just go ahead and turn on the screws and just stop, stop like, letting people write to their home directories across the fleet? Anyone? Nope. Anyone? Nope, okay. Uh, can anyone turn off home directory writing? Anybody? I mean, no, seriously, that's, like, that's or just heavy like, to has, understand has anyone, like, there's a whole on... room of corporate people that are all, like, nope, we could never do that. It would break everything. Or how about, like, who's deployed bit nine in, like, blocking mode? <laughs> One, two people. Okay, yeah. sweet. Um, how about, does anyone, everyone know what version of PowerShell you're using across your fleet? Is it standardized? One person. None? The, the, the right. Zero. Okay, it's not. Um, so, like, we've been looking into PowerShell logging, and you need, a, you need V3. Uh, you got to put all those logs somewhere. You got to consume all those logs somewhere. It's, it's not trivial. Who's been able to actually block macros in your organization? Again, nobody. So, we like trivially like throw this shit out there of like, yeah, just, you know, VLAN Guilty. that off. Like just do some segmentation. And then you're like, wow, that's actually pretty hard. And then my favorite one was just deploy security tooling and find suspicious things. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> just Easy. Not even how, just like, just do the nope, thing. Just do and it. It'll work. You can, I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, was, I'm, I was just floored. So I was like, I've probably said this, I, you know, I didn't go through all my reports, but there's similar stuff in the reports. So I've, so I've been pondering this for a while with my blue shirt on. And so, uh, yeah. And then uh, Chris put out this tweet about doing the basics, and the more I do this, the more I've been doing, thinking about blue team and defending all this stuff, I'm really starting to see that the basics are where we're at, and then when we do pen testing, we usually just load people up with debt, like tech debt, and we find a bunch of bad things. You were at zero, I took you down to 10, and now I'm like, peace out. Yeah, so. Um, so I had kind of this weird same moment together with Chris, but I had it for a completely different reason, which is real weird. Um, and I guess it's just when you have close friends, you end up experiencing similar things to them no matter what. Um, so I was, I was asked to come and build an internal team for a really, really large multinational company. And I got in, and in my first couple days of being in there, I was like, all of the objectives that you gave me for this team are going to make it fail. I'm going to throw all of them away. And that was kind of hard since they already signed the contract with me. Um, but we worked through it. And, you know, effectively, I was like, hey, look, you know, we, we have some major problems if you just want our internal team to just be a testing team, right? 
we have really limited metrics of what we're going to show. Like, for, for the most part, we're just going to bash you with vulnerabilities and take you from where you thought you were down five steps, and then we're going to give you this huge recommendation list like Chris just showed of a whole bunch of shit you just can't do, and then you're going to feel worse about yourself than you did when we first got engaged. So it's going to fracture the team. It looks absolutely nothing like a real attacker. Like, the way people assess environments and test them are completely different than how attackers attack. So if you're trying to pretend that me doing testing is the same thing as you defending a real attack, it's bullshit. There's nothing, nothing's the same about it. You know, maybe the end goal of I have a shell is the same, but even then you probably have a different type of shell. Um, and, and, and really, so it's just kind of like a step above finding vulnerabilities, which to us is just accumulating more crap underneath the rug. And then people go, oh, well, tell me what the really important ones are. And I have no way to evaluate that. I don't understand or know the business. So I could just go, uh, the scanner thinks it's red. And they're like, good, fix the red ones and ignore all the other shit. And that's just the like, worst flaw. Like if I had five types of cancer and they're like, which one's the worst cancer? You know, like that's probably not how I'm going to get healthy. And, and so that took me in the same like weird, oh my God, I've been giving people shitty advice my entire life, pen testing stupid. And I was like, whoa, that sucks. My whole career kind of hit the ground. Um, so we started talking to each other about like, okay, how do, we, how do we build a team that's actually going to be successful? How are we gonna actually provide value instead of just provide debt to companies? So, right, it's super easy. Super. Yeah, you, um, if you wanna build an internal team, you just find hacker people to do hacker shit, and then they go hack stuff, and then you hand a report to somebody being like, this is why you suck. And, and if you wanna be really advanced about it, um, you, you pay, another person to sit on site, and they hang out with the blue team, and they just sit on Skype with the red teamer people, and when the red teamer people like, we popped a bunch of boxes, the person goes, hey, blue team people, guess what? Our other guys popped a bunch of boxes and you still suck. And they're like, wait, what? And you're like, yeah, did you see this thing? Oh, you didn't? <laughs> you didn't. And that's it, that's like, that's, that's legitimately how most of these teams operate, which is really horrible. So we decided to throw it all away and start with kind of something new. Go ahead. I'm gonna make you do it. You make me do it? Yep. All right. <laughs> so Vuln scanning, just running it. Um, red team, like Autopone, you got your Metasploit Pro. I'm gonna move ladder a little bit, purple. Basically, uh, I get to charge for two engineers to show up <laughs> instead of one. All right, so I get to make more money that week and then someone and will just tell you in person how it, bad you yeah, are. Yeah, it's the combination of color, which everybody thinks that executives are you know, retarded even though they run multi-trillion dollar companies. So they're idiots, so they ha we have to be like, okay, Tommy, it's a pink day. You know, like it's no one, t as you said in your last talk, no one takes us seriously so often just because we use terminology that's for fourth graders and then we get treated like fourth graders because we use fourth grader terminology and then we're like, why doesn't anybody take us seriously when we have the like, the world is fucked t-shirt and like, I'm doing a pink day with you. And it, and nobody understands why we kind of don't get taken seriously. Right. So we, we made this another term because everything else sucks that, that I think starts to try and capture what we're supposed to do. So we say that they're adversarial engineers because we exist for simulation, right? Just like a, just like a pilot's simulator works and it's there to put you into the worst possible situation at the lowest level of risk and not the highest so that instead of taking your fighter pilot and putting them up in the air and then going like, haha, kill both the engines, let's see if he lands it. <laughs> we put you in a simulator so that we can kill both the engines, all the controls feel and act and look the same, but you don't have to risk. You can smash the plane into the ground a million different times and all you have to do is restart the simulator until you start to get good at it. And that's what we are there to do. We are there to simulate being an adversary in an engineering fashion. We're not there to be creative artists, to be like, oh, I just magically found this way into your network and you can't find it because I'm super awesome. Like, we want things to be repeatable to the point where it takes the magic out of it and it makes it so easy that anyone could look up exactly how we did it and they could do it themselves because we're not special. All of these things can be even automated for the most part. Yep, so uh, 
A way to approach this is using the cyber kill chain. Everybody heard of this or seen this? Yeah, trademark, Lucky Martin. Uh, the idea is obviously you so want to think about things in a chain and obviously the further to the left you can grab something and see it, the better off you are. Uh, a big drawback of this is that it really stop, actions on objectives is really what where the magic is and what we do uh, as red teamers. And then it's important to, to uh, highlight that and you need to dig into that. Um, yeah. So you, you, want, you got it? Okay. So, Anybody seen the MITRE attack framework? So, awesome, a couple people. So the, the attack Anybody framework. Anybody else? No? Should if not, like definitely check this ATT out. ATT and CK, type it, look at it. It's super cool. Research. It basically picks up where the Lockheed cyber kill chain stops. So it's all post-exploitation. Uh, probably one of the only bad things about it is it's very, very heavy Windows focus. So if you're Mac or Linux, it's kind of lacking some of the techniques for that. but they'll all shim in there together, more or less, right? You're gonna do the same actions that we have highlighted on the left there, uh, whether it's a Linux or Mac. Uh, I just wanna highlight really quickly that it doesn't use funny terms that executives think are ridiculous, like, hey, I'm degrading things, okay. Well, then we're gonna deceive them, like what, are you gonna put a clown suit on and go over to their house and be like, stop typing, la la la, look at me. You know, that's not, that's not real, none of that's real. Like, we have to, we have to get to real terms, so, a lot of this I liked because they were, they were real actual terms. They're terms that people can understand. It's not just magic fun land. Um, they're things that people get. So when you start to look at these, they're actually breaking down persistence mechanisms and they're breaking down all of these different types of things that would happen in a common attack so that we can get away from the idea that a vulnerability is the thing that's gonna make us get to a point of risk or get to a point of loss or get to a point of degradation or something else. We can start just testing each one of these and looking at each one of these iteratively, and then we can take all of these iterations and do really basic math and say, what is the most likely way we're gonna get compromised? We can no longer, we no longer have to even look at vulnerabilities in the environment at all. Because at some point, no matter what, one of these areas is gonna get hit. And if we know how well we do in one of these areas, then we're gonna catch it. You know, it may take us forever to find something that's, and we look at it in one spot. But after they pivot and do something else, we'll find them immediately. So fine, let them hack the box. Trust me, we'll get them in two minutes. We've already tested that a million times. Does that make sense? Because how many people would want this type of understanding of their environment instead of how many vulnerabilities you have? Anyone? I do. Okay, awesome. Then we may provide value to a couple of you. All right, <laughs> so how do you build a team that gets to that? First, we have to have kind of a general problem statement in a charter. <laughs> All right. All right, so I can get this. Uh, so this is kind of the one we're using at work. So we want to like analyze threats. So we're going to start filling out the things in the chart. Um, we want to figure out how to do attack models based on those. So basically we want to break these things down into little pieces of things that we can test and start to get metrics from. Uh, everyone's actually doing detection, prevention, and, and response. How many people actually validate that you have boxes or GPOs or anything that do anything? Like so who's got like carbon black? Anybody using carbon black? Do you guys ever do any tests to make sure like the watch lists are, wor are working? Or do you just wait for like an event to happen and hope that the watch list kicked off? How about firewalls? People have firewalls. Now I can actually see. Him. If you don't, you're just come on. I'll yeah. make fun of you. Same thing for who like has a firewall. All right, cool. Thank you. <clears throat> how often? And how, ma how many of those people test whether the rules actually work or not? Like a tenth of the people that raise their hand. That's bad. We got to fix that. Yeah. And so carrying on like uh, metrics, I'm starting to learn that people way above me care about numbers of things that got fixed or numbers of things that are working or not working. So we need metrics to deliver up to show that all the money that we're paying for these engineers is worth something. Um, yeah, so what are the metrics around uh, threat tactics? What are the metrics around the techniques we're using? And then the TTPs, and obviously the TTPs are their traffic light graph that we're showing. Those are all TTPs, so there's a hundred of those, so how do we actually start going through and figuring out how we can turn a box? Do I just pick that it's green because I think it's green? Or can we just do some testing and simulation 
in order to make it green, yellow, or red. And then with the idea, the, the overall, overall goal is that I want to be able to predict the likelihood of an attack failing or of being successful in my organization before it actually happens. Does any of this make sense yet? Maybe, okay. Second, we want to be able to figure out how are we going to solve these problems. If, if my charter says I'm going to predict whether an attack is successful or not, whatever mechanisms we have today in place are what we use to give our assumption to empower us to say this is how we're going to get compromised. Whether it's all the vulnerability things you have, whether it's the big data machine learning engine that auto does the thing that threat hunts or whatever for you. Um, all of those are, are the input sets that you have to try and predict the future, right? And, and that's what everybody would like, the, the minority report ability that you can precog when an attack is going to happen before it actually happens, right? Wouldn't that be cool to have? So we're, we're positive that the stuff that we're doing can do that because we're actually doing it in big enterprises right now that, that, are, that are showing them exactly what the likelihood of the next attack will be and how bad it'll happen. Because we're able to simulate all of the different iterations of that by looking at these individual components. And, and we have input methods of very, very different ways, right? We have stuff that the red team's interested in, right? Maybe we went to a conference, we went to BrewCon, somebody talked about something really awesome, we come back and we go, let's see if the awesome thing works in our environment, right? We have management, management says, hey, APT 985, this last Mandiant report that Mandiant made up that was fake, but it sounded cool. You know, they, they used all these really high-end techniques because only their product blocks it. And, and, and then we're scared about that because we know that we're going to get attacked by APT 985. Um, how vulnerable are we to them? I went to RSA and they talked about this. I'm yeah. worried about that. How, do, how are we doing it against X, Y, and Z? Yeah, and we can actually reduce everything that's happened in the TTPs that are part of those attack chains and how those operators actually operate. We can overlay it over our map and we can go, oh, here's all the ways that we know. Here's the outlier ones that we haven't been able to simulate yet. So we'll just start simulating those things and at the end we'll give you an answer of how they are in like the next 30 minutes. All right, yeah, so then you have like your threat feeds. They occasionally do bring you something of value or at least something to check your environment out, right? Um, blue teams, I, I'm starting to learn that I'm concerned about way different things than I was concerned about as a red teamer. And so uh, I, I'm also concerned about attacks, but I'm also concerned about how well a blinky box is working or uh, how, how can we use honeypots to make something work in, in a better way. And then the TP, TTP matrix is the same um, attack chart that we were showing. Yeah, and, and one of the things that I think is important about the blue team area is that we want the blue team to engage our team to validate stuff, to help them. You know, we had a tenth of the people that said, hey, we test our firewall rules. Awesome. You don't have time to do it. I want to be part of your team and help. So kick that stuff over to us. We will either write scripts or do it manually or some combination thereof and hand it back to you and you know how well your gear's working. So if you wanna go push your vendor off the side of a cliff because they sent you a, a big spec sheet that says we block all this shit and we're like, no, actually you block one of the 500 things that you said on your sheet, then you get to go back to your vendor and put the hammer to them. And you have all the data from us and we're there to help, right? And the same way goes if we're doing a test and we were able to give that knowledge to you and you want to run it yourself, awesome. Well, here's the scripts that we use. Here's the ways that we did it. So we start actually working as a unified group. It's not red. It's not blue. It's not some stupid color, purple, or whatever else. It's, we're all working as one because our jobs are all employees of the company to work with the company to make the company a better place. That's it. And, and that's where we want to go to. Yeah, I'll add to that, too. That like we're quickly running out of time from the blue team side to actually do red stuff. Yeah. Right, so <clears throat> we don't actually have an internal red team yet, and it would be nice to be able to kick them the things that we're worried about. Instead, it's like I have to carve out time when, I'm, when fires aren't going off. Yeah, and that's like 50 that. other watch lists that you should have written during that right. time. So, and, um, and then who's got an internal red team at where they work? Anybody? And do you guys, does the red team and blue team get along and co collaborate, or is it, yeah, we're mostly no's. And so basically anyone I've talked to that were, have organizations where those are together, it's a challenge to get those guys to communicate, guys and girls to talk and share. And we're talking about we want to share everything. It's, we have a common goal of like making things better. So these teams generally will uh, 
hide IOCs from each other, hide techniques, and then you only have to be as good as your, you only have to be better than their internal red team in order to completely annihilate them, right? And that's not where we want to be. We want to actually do that sparring and then get better over time together. So the third part that we wanted to do is create something that was repeatable. And this is just a huge eye chart, but um, most of the time when you do a pen test, right, you have like a kickoff and then you report findings. Yeah? Yeah, that's, that's how, how most of it goes. Right. Then we have the, the whole blue team side that they're doing their daily operation. Oh, I get to. Um, as they're doing their daily operation, when these two things happen, there's usually a huge cut here, and the blue team eventually gets this report, and then they go back and they go, okay, well, how did they do this and this thing? And they hopefully the report was written well enough that you could actually figure out how they did it instead of like, here's high vulnerability. I was able to own this system through my magic. And they're like, fucking what magic? And they're like, because I'm lead. Suck it. You know, like, and, and you just look at them and you're like, I, this is not a report. Like, how do I do this shit? Like, you didn't help me at all. You just put me into debt. And so what we try and do is as these things naturally work together, as soon as we start finding things, we go through each iteration and say, okay, in my intel gathering phase, I was able to collect this and this and this and this. That led me towards the end attack. Now we open an individual ticket to work with the blue team and say, during this phase, we found these three things. Tell me in your controls how you were able to protect, detect, and respond to these three things in information gathering. And then we just work our way up the food chain between vulnerability assessment, exploitation, whether we're doing privilege escalation, whether we're doing lateral movement, and each one of those is a separate project to work on the controls together until we get them to a point where I'm like, hey, you're seeing everything that I do, or they get to a point where they go, I can't see that, and there's no tool or no process or no thing that I have to see that. Does that make sense, kind of? Right? So we're working together to find where the gaps are, to find whether it's coverage, find whether it's execution, find whether it's automation, turn the screw tighter. There's other ways to do it too, right? Yeah. So kind of, how, kind of how we're tackling is built a detection net, and it's really just a um, mirror of the hosts that we have in our environment. So this is like a slimmed down version because we're missing all the Windows hosts and everything. But we have a tack net, we have a detection net where all the instrumentation we have for work is on these various boxes. Um, yep, clicky. I'll take the clicky. Um, and then basically we took the things from the attack framework and I've basically been writing these out and with working with Chris. Of, all right, so for account discovery, let's start laying out what tools do we, do we use to do that, right? So everyone, when someone gets on host, they're going to run net commands, DS query commands, WC, WMIC commands in order to start pulling information about the accounts on the system, accounts in the domain. You guys familiar with this? Yeah? Okay, a couple people. Now I want to automate that, because the idea is I want to make sure that I want to do unit testing from our detection rules. So now I can write a bat file. In this case, one of the bat files I wrote, it just runs through a bunch of things that bad guys or attackers would do once they get on host uh, that, I've, that we have written rules for. And then so we can set jobs or run these as we required, and then I want to make sure that they're actually alerting and that flow is working like it should. Does that make sense? Is that interesting, or do you guys, is anybody doing that already? Someone got like a half of like half of that's not interesting. <laughs> All right, it's maybe it's not. I, I fi I'm finding that it's important to um, the idea like making sure that things that we have work is super important. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one of the things that we need to do. Um, as, as we're trying to iterate through all these different TTPs and testing it as a team, uh, the biggest value that we're finding now as we're, we're using this method of testing is making large-scale information sharing platforms for the people that are involved, right? So if, if somebody in a particular business unit we're doing tests with wants to start to be part of the testing, if the blue team wants to do some of the iteration that we're doing, if the red team wants to write some of the rules that the blue team is writing so that we can hand them pre-canned rules and go, oh, hey, you guys are really busy. You asked us to test, is the firewall working? We did this. We found that only five out of the 100 things actually blocked. So we also wrote some rules in Splunk to say, if you also get through and you do it this way, it'll catch the outliers for you and hand them the whole package. And then we showed them how we found it, where we found it. So we've been putting together things uh, like, like wikis 
Um, so like there's Pwn Wiki, there's a bunch of other wikis that we have out there where we're structuring them along the same framework that we were using in attack so that they can dig into each side and they go, oh, I want to spend some time today working on our ability to catch persistence. And they go into persistence and they'll see every single one of the techniques that we have. They'll see what our grading is. They'll see if there's techniques that we haven't graded yet and they want to start helping us work on. So they can go, oh, well, it, we know how this level of persistence thing works. We'll install it. We'll grade ourselves. We'll update the matrix for them. And then when the red team comes in to validate those things, maybe they've already done some of our job for us because they had some time or vice versa. Yeah, we're, we're using like uh, internal confluence just for the way. Yeah. Just the idea is just keeping that somewhere so it can be used later and it's not just in someone's mind or on their laptop. Because it can't die with the team. You know, teams have lots of attrition now and people are, you know, too busy playing the Silicon Valley style money grab, like, oh, hey, I'm going to get my shares, invest, and leave, and then go do the next thing. So you can't, you can't have this stuff die with the members of your team. It has to live in the company for the company. Um, one thing that we also stress is that when you assemble the team and tools for doing stuff like this, don't ever act like pen testers and act like auditors. People who are owning your environment 100% of the time are never going to be like stopping and pulling over in like their, you know, track suit and jumping out of their like gold-plated Mercedes Benz and then running over to their console and like loading up Metasploit. That's not going to happen. They're, they're, not, they're not like, you know, firing up their Windows box and turning on core. They're not like running vulnerability scanners that cost tens of thousands of dollars. They don't do any of that stuff, right? So while that stuff is really cute for the audit teams and everybody else who's trying to find these metrics things, like our teams have to be built on actual usage, right? We have to actually be able to say that we can model an environment. So if we're going into a large SCADA environment or something like that, and there's 200 boxes we need to model, that we can P to V the whole environment and then do all of our testing and lab work right there. Um, and we need to actually have access to all of the defensive tools because our job is going to be how well is this stuff working. We need to get our telemetry of what's going on. All right, that's going to be important once, you know, the kind of the first iteration of this is making sure like your basic alerts are working and you want... After that, you want to start evading those and seeing how, how do I evade the things we have in place. So uh, everyone's going to need access to Splunk, access to the various uh, security dashboards in order to, when I'm t trying to tweak an attack to evade it, does it, how, how can I make sure? I can't, can't like, hey, Chris, did that work? <laughs> I, I can't do that all day. It's a lot easier for me to just log into it or programmatically query what I'm looking for. Creating formal collateral is important um, when there's so many of these talks going on of I have a red team and I did the hacks and you're totally screwed and I got DA and all these other ridiculous terms that the business does not take seriously. We had to create large amounts of formal collateral to let people know what value we bring to the organization and why and how to interact with us and how to engage with us. We had to have social campaigns for people to understand that we're actually there to help because every time they hear of some of the types of stuff that we do, they immediately go, oh, you're the person who comes in, takes down a bunch of my systems, causes a bunch of debt, laughs at me and points at me and then walks away. And that's the reputation almost all of us have. So we had to create a formal collateral set that said, no, here's, here's our objectives, here's our goals, here's exactly how we're gonna do them, and, and give them some sense of mind that we were gonna act professionally in the environment and that we're gonna actually add value to the program. Um, what we started to find is that even though, even though we did all those things, most people were just like, okay, you're the red team? Oh, yeah. And so we had to like start changing our names because people immediately were like, red, oh, color wheel. Oh, those are the people who treat me like idiots. No, forget it. Get out of here. I have no time they, for them. Yeah, they just, they, they just, they just started with those. I'm, so I'm definitely wrestling with uh, pen testing, the perception that pen testing just creates work. And you don't, that we don't want a whole bunch of pen testers just running around breaking stuff. And having collateral and having output from what you're doing helps with that. Otherwise, they just feel like there's a bunch of guys in there smashing things and creating work for other people and de derailing things. And when you have output that someone can see that, oh, we're paying these guys, it's, it's, it helps. Okay, to the meat of the fun stuff. So after you get the team set up, you have to have a process to get all this measurement in place. The first part of the measurement is getting an idea of defensive coverage that you have. All right, so you can pretty easily with the teams that you have, even though it's wicked hard to see. Um, go through the controls that exist and the products that exist 
And in theory, just, just papering out with, with the teams, with the defense team, because you guys on the defense side and offense side should know what products and what controls are going to stop each phase of the chain, right? Like, do you, do you think you guys could create this on your own? Silence? Nobody. No or I got yes? A couple nods. Anybody okay. have one of these? This, I mean, this, we should have put the mind blown slide on here because yeah, I've, ne I've never really been anywhere that did this. You have all this stuff in a rack, but I've really never laid out of like what it's supposed to help me out with. Right. Like we, we are paying 100 G's for FireEye. Well, it only covers two out of the eight <laughs> yeah. things. That's kind of important to like think about, right? Like, and, but logs, logs cover all eight. If I want to detect all those things, I need to have logging. Uh, I mean, I've. Who, who makes sure that everything's logging and your log stash forwarder is going where it was? And do you check to make sure that you're still getting logs from a month? You know, we'll occasionally find something stopped logging a month ago and you're like, shit, like, I needed those. Yeah, right. And that's like the total, I bag on FireEye because I can and I should, but it's the FireEye like life cycle story, right? They're like, we block all the APTs and, the, and then the, the execs are like, we got to block the APTs. And then the budget comes up, and they're like, more disk space or block APTs? And they're like, block APTs. And they're like, well, no, the log thing we super, super need. Like, this is only a little tiny piece, and this is huge. Are and we... since this chart hasn't been made, they really don't understand what they're, what they're trying to do. It's just, it's all media nonsense. Right? How... So there's nothing tactical about Sorry. it. Or how everything's vulnerability-driven, and then patching is just for really oh, yeah. exploitation. So we spend all this time worrying about vulnerabilities and missing patches, and it's one little sliver out of that whole giant chart. So we may be re me misallocating resources and time if, if we're worrying about that. Yep. So after Chris and I had started doing some of these, we realized that, that we're going to have to take a different approach to measuring offense because if we're measuring defense in this way and, and already able to provide value on how to cost decide what you're going to spend money in, 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 in we need to be able to use the red team to validate whether that's actually correct or not, or whether there's other things inside of the testing that's going to break that down. So we decided we were going to take everything in that big matrix, and we were going to start grading them. And we would start grading these TTPs. So we'd say, here's what our detection maturity is, and here's what our protection maturity is. Now, we've also gotten to a response maturity, but it takes forever to talk about. So we're just going to start with protect and detect. Okay. So pretty basic, I have no controls, I have some stuff centralized, I have centralized stuff but no automation. Then I have like some automation and it's functional but it's not really accurate, I just get a bunch of noise. And then at the end it's tuning. So if you look at this model, anyone know kind of where it comes from? It's, it's all capability maturity, right? I have nothing to finely tuned, highly, highly optimized. And, and that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a system that is constantly optimizing itself. Talk to this. Sure. Um, one of the things that everyone's worried about is uh, dumping password hashes. So Mammy Cats is everyone's like worst nightmare, it seems like. And or yeah, or dumping creds, or just dumping the hash once you're a local admin. So the idea is we want to like lay out on the left what's the technique, what are we doing, uh, and then as we move over the function. So someone that's not intimately familiar with this needs to know what the hell we're talking about. So like that function column is giving you the background, and then we want to lay out what we're actually doing in the organization for detection and protection for that, which is, to me, was mind-blowing. So you will probably want to have a generic thing of like, oh, well, you know, we can you know, do a G, uh, registry change and it should stop Mimi Cats from working. But the, let's, what are the actual rules behind that? So same thing for detection. If you've got a, a good detection thing, if you've got carbon black, when someone does the, does the reg poke to actually change that back, can I detect that? Right, and then same thing for protection. We've got... Uh, protected user groups or whatever, and where these things shouldn't work, but we may not have actually tested that they worked. And one of the other really important things that we figured out was this whole last test date. Uh, because these techniques over time have decay. Decay in the accuracy of our score. Because as I'm doing a memory dumping process and I put a whole bunch of cool controls in place and my, my score starts to rise and I start to get better at it, some ninja like y'all in this room will come up with a new technique that completely makes all of these scores totally wrong because we've never knew about how that technique worked. You find some random place where some other way you could dump it and now all of our controls and the ways that we've evaluated that aren't accurate anymore. So we have a decay date where when's the last time that we tested it? 
so that we can get a better understanding of how much confidence do we have in our own scores. And then we start making those scores out for each one of these areas, right? Is this all kind of driving and making sense, or is it crazy? Yes. Okay. And then from there, we're able to go back to creating this chart, right? So it's, it, it's oddly, it's not a very, very difficult process to get to a point where we can create this chart. But what we also found inside of this is that if you just do unit testing, Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> I love this slide. So this is kind of like where we're at because we're, I'm actually in the unit testing phase of this. I'm trying to figure out what we're doing for a specific TTP. Um, but just because I can detect a TTP when Chris's team is like working through that flow, of put chaining all my reds in that chart together, uh, just because I have an alert, it may not work when they do it as a flow. Yeah, and, and so you see if, if I said I know where my weaknesses are here, but, but I was going to run a full simulation. Maybe you thought I was going to start at legitimate credentials, but I decided to start here at add monitor. So now I'm taking an entire chain across to try and find the reds in the easiest ways through the environment, but you're myopically focused on the ones that you think I'm going to make. Right? So the difference is that we're not only doing the unit testing, but then we're trying to emulate and understand all of the different possible chains that can go there and which one of the chains is most likely to occur. Um, that's really how we get to a point of skill because not every adversary is going to have the same level of skill. Not every tester that you have is going to be an O'Day writer or is going to be script master or is going to be Linux guru or Windows or AS400 guru or whatever. So we want to be able to evaluate exactly what kind of vocabulary we're going to have around sophistication. Because if I have a bunch of reds that look like they're a bad chain, but every single one of those is going to take ninja level NSA style skill, but I have a second chain that's a little bit worse and it takes novice skill, then I need to understand that I have to protect and I have to simulate the novice skill stuff and train my environment to be ready for the novice thing before I start training the NSA thing. Because my controls and my protection techniques are gonna be totally different against each of those adversaries. That, that prioritizes work and testing as well, right? I, I, I wanna do the one that the novice can do first before the NSA level one. Yeah, so this is an example in some of the charting that we're doing where we're actually grading each one of the attack styles and we're taking those graded attack styles and we're saying how much we're able to detect in them. Right. Finally, as we were talking about kind of prioritizing workload, we have to get a better understanding of when that last date of decay was. So did I test the NSA style things last at a certain time? Did I test this one technique at a certain time? And why is that relevant? Right. So. Um, to add to that, you know, maybe you, you, net the account discovery things, that's not changing too often. Everyone's going to use net commands and do whatever. But, you know, sub T is releasing, Casey's releasing a new uh, whitelist bypass thing every week. So I need to maybe take more, pay more attention for those types of TTPs if that's something I'm worried about. Um, also, you know, generally based on your vertical, you're going to be worried about specific groups attacking you. And so using some of the tools that Minder's released, you can actually... Uh, step through and say, okay, so here's the Carabank, Carabank, Carabank uh, group or the Lazarus group. Here's the techniques that they use, and then you could actually build these assimilations based on people that you're worried about. Yeah, one, one of the favorite things that I've had during creating this internal team for people is, is this exact kind of example. Somebody said, I had this particular group that we are worried about, and we were able to, within the first 20 minutes, go into the chart, take a look at everything that we've iterated testing, give them a level of probability of how we would get compromised by that stuff, run a million Monte Carlo iterations against the entirety of the chart, then give them a pretty accurate scoring of exactly how it was and go, oh yeah, we're not gonna have a fully accurate score because they also use two techniques that we've never tried before, but we're gonna move those two techniques to the top of the list and start trying them. And as soon as those are done, I will be able to give you a reasonably accurate score of exactly how vulnerable we are to this. And at what time, if they attacked us using their normal ways, how quick it would take us to catch them and get them out. Now, any of your executives want that? When the bad guy attacks me, how long is it going to take you to get them out or to find them? Because 
we're doing that before we even met the bad guy for the first time. All right, defensive measurement. Um, this is super important because as, as we're measuring all of the different actions of the red team, whether it's iterating each one of those TTPs, whether it's how many boxes we compromised, whether it's at what time we, we compromised them or whatever else, we also have to have all of the same correlating metrics on the blue team side. Right, so you know, things we're worried about, total coverage. Um, and I think we have a chart or a graph coming up for that of like, do we have, where do we have gaps? Uh, mean time to detection, that's super important. Then mean time to remediation, and then kind of sub underneath that is, so say I popped, uh, I compromised 10 hosts, but you only found five. The fact that I only did 50% eradication is super important to know. And a lot of times, I'm not seeing a lot of ways to, an easy way or ways to capture those metrics. Um, how, are, how well our protection controls work, because you probably have a whole hardening team in your organization, like their whole job is to do protection, right? Jump hosts and, GP or GPOs and two fac and everything else. How how well did those work? And then um, automated versus manual detection. So, um, do we have rules that are uh, alerting and firing on this, or do I have to like have something else fire off and then I have to go hunting through six different systems in order to find that information? Um, and then it's kind of the same thing for response. So, like just to kind of show you like how you could do this. Um, say that I knew uh, which, you know, because we're the red team, we know what hosts we compromised. You, you can programmatically, like, and I know that Chris Gates is on, he's the analyst on call this week. Let's go through and check my search history in Splunk to see what I was actually searching for to see if I found those hosts that we compromised. So this is basically to show, and that's the query that searches the, all my queries in Splunk, and then it showed me searching for a specific server. So in a real world, I was searching for the 10 hosts that we knew we compromised. Um, but the idea that I just wanted to share is like, you can programmatically do this with the APIs for all your security tools. So your SIMs, if you're using Phantom Cyber, ArcSight, you can, because you know the answer to the test, you can now proactively say, well, how long did it take, I think we do the, how long did it take from when I, I started the attack and did something, how long did it take for detection, and then how long for remediation, some other things. So maybe the first one was three days. Um, but the other one was 20 minutes. Or yeah, and, minutes. and that was one of those things that totally blew my mind is we may have in the iterations been able to go, oh, it took you two full days to find that I was doing this thing. But if I look at the next iteration of me pivoting on a box, it took you 50 minutes to find that. So the actual time of you catching me is the time between when I started and after the end of that 50 minute clock, not the initial attack. The initial attack's an opportunity for us to get better at step one, but if we know that we're gonna catch you at step two, maybe we don't have to invest a huge amount of cost in step one because we already got to a point where we're catching you in a reasonable amount of time. Right, so like maybe step one's the fish, and we don't always do a great job at immediately finding fishing. It really depends, it's really very, very organization dependent on how well that works, <laughs> right. and then how many, how many uh, People, how many emails got sent, but say it was successful, they landed and it took, took us, that was two days ago, but within 50 minutes of you doing uh, account discovery or lateral movement, we're gonna catch you every time. So that's a really important metric to capture. Yep. Uh, and this slide is just to show that we've, I've started actually writing out all the, tech, the TTPs from the attack framework, and I'm at like line 300 or so, and we haven't even started adding tools. So uh, th the rabbit hole's like really deep on these, but it's super useful. If you can identify all the tools that are related to a TTP, and then how you're detecting and protecting against those, it's pretty valuable. So after we're able to build a team and put together all of the stuff, to be able to get defensive metrics, to be able to get offensive metrics, to get an understanding of the coverage that we have of our defenses, right? We're able to give some really, really new and meaningful stuff up the food chain that is no longer increasing debt. We're just measuring the environment accurately, right? We're able to say that here's the types of techniques that are detectable. You can see where the gaps are immediately with collection and exfiltration. You can understand, oh, these are the ones per detected per control. Well, Carbon Black's doing a hell of a lot of work and NetFlow isn't doing crap right now. Now, does that mean NetFlow isn't tuned well enough because maybe it'll fill these gaps, or does it mean Carbon Black's super awesome? Does it mean that we can just remove one of these tools from our environment? You know, there's a lot of things that we have in our environments where 
you know, I look at one of the clients that we work for and they have three different bromium-like products, including bromium. And I'm like, why do you have all this stuff? And they're like, I don't know, we just bought it. You know, and they're like, does it work? And they're like, it should. You know, but if it doesn't, we've got the other two and they're on the box too. And, you know, we have to have i7s with like 32 gigs of RAM for everybody because that bitch takes up a lot of resources. Must but be, must be okay. I didn't get an email. Yeah, haven't gotten, I haven't gotten an alert. Or the thing that, that pains me more than anything else in enterprises is the people who clap and applaud and they look at the chart and the chart says blocked 900 million bad emails, blocked 464,000 C2 events. FireEye caught these malicious binaries. They like think that's good. And I'm looking at it saying, you know, we found 900 different types of cancer today in you, but we stopped it. But wh why would you ever want to say, I want to find zero types of cancer in me today and tomorrow and the next day. So what we're trying to do is make metrics that are reasonable so that we can say, here's how much coverage you have, here's how mature you are, here's how maturity has grown over time, here's the t techniques that we can detect, and this is real. We know that at best we're doing 35%, at best. Now that doesn't mean a certain tool's there or whatever else is there, it just means it is what it is. We're able to measure it. And then we're able to take all of these things, use different iterations, and simulate what this is gonna look like over time. Right? I can tell you what it's going to look like tomorrow or six years from now. I can tell you at the rate of technology and how it occurs. I can take every single one of these and I can make a million different paths through this chart. And then I can take the chart and turn it a million different colors and I can tell you the probability of what's going to happen attack-wise, right? The, the biggest piece of this for me was trying to distill all of those magic things down, which, by the way, would anyone want to be able to show this type of stuff? Like, is this relevant? Can anybody show this right now? Like, can one team show this, anyone? Awesome. Either we're doing it wrong or it's valuable. <laughs> So I, I think about this, distilling all of this work down to one graph. This one graph is what do we do next? We did testing, what do we do next? So we have this whole idea of we did a test and this is the total protection, right? We did one test, in that test, you had the ability to catch me doing all the things. Then we have the next idea of, well, this is our potential. Well, we had FireEye, we had this, we had that. We, we didn't have a net flow there. We didn't have these black, carbon black rules in. Well, carbon black was on four of the seven hosts, right? So there's gonna be some type of gap. And then we actually have, what did you detect? Following me? So what I can find now is the execution gap of the difference between what the potential of our tools in our environment could do versus what we actually did. And I can find whether I have a coverage gap. Right? This was mind-blowing and magical to me because for my entire career, I have been trying, searching all over the place of how I can show somebody in a graphic that buying a new tool makes your security program worse. Because what it does is if you have this gap, and this gap is 40%, and this gap is 20%, and you go, oh, we're gonna buy more shit, what happens? You have a larger execution gap. You don't fix anything. So the more stuff that you buy, if you're not actually measuring how well you execute with those items, you're just gonna have larger gaps in your environment. You're gonna perform worse until you're able to simulate how well you perform with the tools you have in your hands. You know, if you give me a chainsaw, of course I think I can use it. I probably can't but I'm just gonna rip it stuff and chainsaw the hell out of things. Now, if I have to get a bigger chainsaw because I wasn't chainsawing, right, I'm probably gonna cut my arm off. I'm not gonna just be better at chainsawing because I have a more expensive chainsaw. And this is what we wanna try and show people, the difference between the actual and the execution and what coverage is so that people can make an informed decision on what are they going to do next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you said five. Three times. I got it. I'm just not ignoring you. I don't care. <laughs> Do doesn't matter to me. Um, so. <laughs> we still so, love you. Yeah. So, 
so really, you know, this is, this is what we're trying to get to. We're trying to get so that people can take all of our data and they can make an informed decision. We're not making the decision for them. We're just giving them the data and letting them make it themselves. Future? All right, so we want to start automating uh, this correlation and doing these attacks, um, especially the simulations. So there's people are taking stabs at tools to do this. Um, like, can we, can we do yeah. name, like fire, fire drill? Yep. Fire, fire drill. drill is a perfect example of uh, automating these TTPs and automating these attacks and able to run these things, and you can now programmatically start to get answers to these questions. Um, the idea of we want to predict attacks before you can run them. So via the stuff that Chris and I showed, you know, new actor uses these techniques. How how vulnerable or how likely is that to succeed or work in our environment? Yep. Um, and you know, finally, we want to be able to understand not only attacker TTPs but defender TTPs, right? So then we can have a more enriched environment for us to give better higher resolution, more accurate, more confident metrics back to the business so that the business gets to make the decision of do we get better at execution, do we get more coverage, or do we have a mix of the two? Uh, because, because I think we're the wrong people to be telling the business what to do next. We're the right people to measure it. Um, and, and really, at the end of all of this, it's, it's getting a better understanding of how all of the security tooling that we have in the environment, in the environment itself, work together. And in order to, to show how they work together, we have to be that agent of change. We have to be something that works together with the environment, with the, the defense team, offense team, whatever team you want, and just be team dollar sign company. And that's it. We don't want to be individual islands. We want to show that a team mentality could actually change how companies work, opposed to just you know, telling them that they suck and hoping that they get better. So that's that's it. Any questions? No one no one got the dodgeball <laughs> reference. Anyone? No? Okay. <laughs>